I would say successful classic car dealerships, not the best quality in the region, I would say probably the best. He's Asil Yassin, he's the head of Tumini Classics, and please join us on stage. You're not Miss Worlds, you don't have to shave it. Thanks for joining us, boys. Thank you. So if you're just sitting down joining us, we're talking about how to make a fortune on classic cars. And obviously, we're going to look at some beautiful classic cars that will be all over the backdrop today. So my first question to both of you really is, now pay attention, pay attention. What defines a classic car to you? And I'll start with Fred. I believe anything from 1979 backwards and downwards. Backwards and upwards? That's every car ever made. Probably is, uh, be it coupe. Uh, be it saloon, sedan, uh, convertible, cabriolet, uh, half, whatever. I mean, seriously, uh, the cars have been making, the, the manufacturers have been making cars for a very, very long time. And um, we are here to support them and bring them back to life. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Frederick. What do you do? Because the District 31 is a name that doesn't say much, but actually you've got quite a reputation in this country, isn't it? What is it for? Um, well, simply we clean cars, but it takes us a very long time to do it. Are you just very slow? Uh, maybe, yes. We don't like making mistakes. Mistakes uh, are a bad thing. We're talking about million dollar cars, right? Uh, sometimes up to 53 million dollars. We have done some of the world's most expensive cars. It's nice to know that the owners entrust us with their cars and they actually believe in us. And that's why we keep on giving them year after year. So it's the science of detailing, if I'm being correct here. Um, yes, it's the art of detailing. Uh, we work with Japanese, German, Swiss companies. Uh, we do our own research and development. We do, we, I teach, I, I make my own training, um, I support my staff. It's, it's a lot of things. It seems like it's a pretty good job and it's one that's often little understood because you've seen cars being cleaned in malls and scraped, etc. And you think that's obviously very different from what you do at your level. Yes, um, it's an art. It really is an art. It's an ideology. There's a philosophy behind ideology, it. Ideology? That's a bit strong. I uh, know, absolutely. Uh, when it comes to the level of detailing that we do, we have to use such words. Well, I like that word. It's a good start. It's a strong start. We're talking how to make a fortune on classics. But before we get to that, let's meet Asil and see what you do exactly at Tomini because you're the head of classics. What does that mean? Uh, hello. Good evening, all. Head of Classics, I manage the company, I run the company. Uh, we're a s relatively small team of seven people in our showroom and then eight or nine people in the workshop. Um, yeah, we're there to sell post war European sports cars, share them with Dubai. Or... So, how many cars are in the Classic Company Classic Collection at the moment? Uh, internationally, you're looking at about 110, 115, but it's a moving target every week. Well, how many of the 110 cars? And they're worth some serious money. What's the most expensive car in the collection? The most valuable car currently in the collection, which will no longer be in the collection soon, is uh, a 1937 Alfa Romeo 6C, which used to be owned by uh, Mussolini. <laughs> Mussolini? It's the last car that Mussolini rode in as a free man before he was caught at the border with his mistress. He actually bought the car for his mistress. That's an amazing story. Um, Did yeah. you drive it? No, I didn't. So it hasn't come to Dubai yet. We saw them before we went to Dubai. So that's part of the international collection. Whereas we have about 95 currently in the UAE. 95 cars in the UAE. It's quite a big operation. And you do quite a bit of detailing yourself as well with three year old fit. We, we, take, we take our collection and the company and, and sales and everything quite seriously. Uh, detailing, you know, we don't we don't prioritize it the way Fred does. Uh, when we have a big show coming up, there's only one place to take a car. That's actually to the, these guys over here. Uh, but for general show display, uh, we have our in-house guys who have our detailing. Guys. Perfect. So, to you, who lives, breathes, sells, sleeps, potentially in cars occasionally, what defines a classic car to you? Well, first of all, I completely disagree with this guy here. Uh, yeah, because he just named every car ever made. Yeah, until 1979 though, because the Ferrari F40 is from 1988, 1989 all the way to 1992, but it's still a classic. Um, but that's a modern classic. So let's try to work this definition down, make it very simple for the folks here at the Dubai Motor Show. So I, I'd call an F40 a contemporary classic more than a modern classic, just because in my mind, you know, modern is even younger. 
but again, in order for us to define them, we also have to define each of those words within this context. So it's, it's much more complicated than people think. I'd say it's anything that's no longer in production, first of all, obviously, has to no longer be in production, needs to be relatively collectible or at least have a cult following. Uh, uh, Sounds like you've thought about this answer, well done. So, is there a yearly cutoff? Which is not 1979. What's your cutoff? Well, I don't, I don't have the yearly cutoff. I mean, is it 2015 by Hatsu Syrian a classic? No, I don't get it. The cars that should be, they're not in production anymore. The Ferrari Enzo in production in 2005-2006, but that is a classic. So, if the car is no longer produced, then it can fall into one of the subcategories of classic. And hold on, does that mean that the Morris Marina is a classic? That's not in production anymore, is that a classic? It has an owner's club. I mean, yes, it's an owner's club full of very interesting people in case they need the Morris Marina owners I said, They're not interesting people. Yeah. I've just alienated the three people in the audience who might have a Morris Marina. <laughs> so, if there's a cult following for a car, I, I, I do think it's just a classic. We had this discussion once before as well. I still stand by that. Yeah. All right. So generally, it's a pretty broad definition of what defines a classic car today. Yeah, it's not the kind of classics we deal with. We don't deal with every shape and form of classic cars. We don't have old Silvery Bellairs or, you know, 450 SLCs and things like that. So why don't you have any American cars? Uh, the, the, we, 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 have, we, we, have, we have two, uh, but it's not really to our taste. It's not the kind of cars we So it's not the kind of things you collect because there are people into French art, postmodernist art, etc. It's from different countries, etc. Yeah, it, it's, it's idiosyncratic. You know, we're not, we're not particularly fans of majority of American cars. We'd love to have a Tucker, for example, one day. Wouldn't we all? Yeah. Okay, does anybody in the audience know what a Tucker is? Two people know what a Tucker is. I know, so I know who Chris Tucker is. You know who Chris Tucker is? Three of them are all friends of ours. <laughs> so the Tucker was a very rare car that was made in the late 40s, 1948. And with only about 50 cars exist. 50 cars built. Yeah. yeah. And they're extremely rare and extremely valuable. That's a great example of the kind of car we're talking about. Because if you can find a Tucker and you can afford to buy it, you've just made yourself a fortune. Because those cars are only going up. So that's a perfect example. Well, looking, looking at our subject points as well, how to make a fortune on a classic car, usually you need to have a fortune first. You know, that's you a sticky problem. Do we yeah. have a fortune? That's the question. Yeah. You fold out wrong or fell down wrong. You, know, you need money to make money. Why does it have to be all in cars? Why can't it be motorcycles? Because this is the Dubai Motor Show, not the Dubai Motorcycle Show. Otherwise we can talk about the 400 million dollar painting that got sold this morning, right? <laughs> I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, I can't pay 400 million dollars for a painting, I just don't think that's right. A prof superior motorcycle, that's what happened against them. We're sticking to cars because I'm the moderator and I like cars, not like motorcycles. I was talking to someone earlier who mentioned that there was a 75,000 euro truffle sold in auction. And cars, I'm not giving the message. <laughs> cars. Cars. See what I have to work with here? Uh, okay. I like to use the word art. I'm trying to get back on the cars. cars. What did he have for breakfast? How did he conclude these fenders? How did he stretch the car into this shape? Uh, these are things that go through my mind. I don't think he did it all by himself. I think a man did it for him or several men to build it. So. It's usually one person who decides to do something. Yes, and that's the cool thing is that somebody that actually starts asking you each and say something. Yeah, I... I, I cars, aren't art. Like, cars aren't art. Cars aren't art. I think they can be artistic. I think they can be, they can be classified as mechanical art. I think the purpose of art should be nothing but... It should be there to... It's only purpose is itself. Whereas a car does have a purpose. It can move you around and transport people. So I definitely think they can be artistic. You know, looking at the flowing lines of the XK140 up there, and the little details of the Maserati Ghibli, they could be artistic, but I wouldn't classify them as art because they have more than one function, not just to be static and looked at. So a painting, its only function is to be looked at and, you know, uh, uh, people think about it, ponder on it, philosophize about it, but a, a, a car doesn't really, it doesn't only exist to be... It's also a mode of transport, but still you agree to some extent it's art. Uh, it's artistic. Uh, it can't it's be very autistic in a way. <laughs> Alright, let's ask the audience. Show of hands. Are cars an art form? Hands up for yes. Okay. Alright, that's a reasonable sort of half. <laughs> hands up for no. Who thinks cars aren't an art form? Should we, oh, ask, just should we ask them why? Oh, go on. Am I the microphone? Art should have no other purpose but itself. It is the definition, so... I can't argue with Oxford. Yeah, yeah, but... 
if a car, if a, if a static and inanimate object looks good and it can be considered a form of art like these things, when it's not in motion, is that not art? If it's just parked there, is that not art? to entertain and philosophize and as he said, yeah, it, it, had, it was built to be fast, luxurious or something else, but not just to be art. Uh, I, I, to differ. I, bet, I really bet to differ. I have clients, I have a lot of people that I work with. I have people who admire their cars. I have people who take their cars into their garages, build walls behind them, uh, lift the cars up and just sit down and enjoy them. So he's not a car anymore. anymore, he's just an installation of But he has other cars that he drives. He has um, he has a collection, uh, but there are some that he just wants to keep to himself. That's a weird sort of thing, isn't it? What do you think drives that sort of mind, to keep a car behind a wall where nobody can see it? A few weeks ago, somebody in Japan came up with a Ferrari, sorry, a McLaren F1 that had zero mileage, delivery mileage, it was that still... That to me is awful, that is awful. Why would a car that never be driven? Because somebody can afford to have two or three of them, he will have two or three to drive, and he will keep one or two in his garage and save it, and make a hell of a lot of money later on. But it's not so like there's an investment at the end of the day. It's not like you have two or three detailing companies that you keep, and only one of them does any actual work. Um, well, when I come to think about it, I think there are only about seven or eight people in the world who do exactly what I do which is a fair point. So we're talking about how to make a fortune on classic cars. Let's get into the meat of it. And first off, I just want to briefly ask you, gentlemen, do classics make a good investment? And if so, why are people putting money into classic cars? Where is the market suddenly come from? Salam Well, I mean, there are a lot of... Uh, Since Salam Oh, sorry, did you say Asil? Asil will go first. He uh, has a nicer mustache. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it, was, it was a process. It, it, was, it was a process. Certain, certain cars have been collected, or you know, for the right reason, just I liked this car, so I wanted to have one. Then it turns out there's a whole population of people who want it as well. Um, and then bit by bit, little differences, little details on certain cars made them more collectible. Well, then, of course, auctions and public sales made things go crazy. You know, um, yeah. okay. um, I believe that uh, manufacturers like Rolls Royce, uh, Packard, in the old days, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they were really making, I mean, they were Ford was making cars for the people, Volkswagen, you know, the people's car. They, they made cars for everybody. But the elite manufacturers, Bugatti, uh, uh, Ferrari, Lamborghini later on in life, um, they, they all came up with things that they wanted to become elite. They wanted to become very special. They wanted to become the only ones in the world. And uh, today's a rarity. Rarity is what you say. Today I was looking at the Rolls Royce stand and it actually mentioned the horsepower. Whereas in the old days, it was sufficient horsepower. Thank you. Horsepower. Why I mention it? Because it wasn't about speed. It was about luxury. It was about the elite. It was about targeting a certain gentleman or a certain person who could afford to buy it. So how is the classic car market doing as opposed to other markets like the markets for art, etc.? Why is the classic car market the one to invest in? And what are the sort of returns people are getting? Also in 2009-2010 we saw the cycle of the classic car market pick up again, like it did in the mid-90s. Um, and so, you know, the, the market crashes, all these cars are cheap, people are flocking towards it, then you have non-car people who see that, oh, well, these are things are going so up. It's kind of like a buying trend, is that everybody just gets into the rush. And that plateaued, that, really, that, that did plateau, because all these investors who knew nothing about cars suddenly are uh, paying record prices for them, thinking, oh, it's going to shoot up, I'm going to be without understanding the industry. Now buyers have become a lot wiser, they know the questions to ask, they know what to look for. Uh, and that, is, that has completely changed the game in the last year and a half. It seems to me like there are two kinds of buyers we're talking about. We're talking about the institutional buyers, the people who have investments and portfolios. And then there are people like me who don't even know what the word portfolio means, but who just like cars and get into it. And we're also driving up a certain segment of the market for certain kinds of cars. Would you say that's accurate? Yes, because like I said, if there's a population of people who also like a car, let me rephrase, if you love, really love a certain model of car, it's likely that there's a population of other enthusiasts that are also interested in it. 
I mean, the reason uh, we have a 250 Luso on the, on the, you know, in the section over there. It's Who makes the Luso? For people who have no idea what you're talking about. Sorry. Uh, Ferrari, the last of their 250 engine series cars was the 250 GT Luso. And we have one on our stand. They built 350 of them, which was a record build number for Ferrari in those days. And it's worth $2 million today on average. And the reason it's worth $2 million today, you know, I was, I was saying it earlier, I say it a lot, the car is expensive because it's special. It's not special because it's expensive. You have an army of thousands of people who can afford it and want to buy it, but they only need 350 of them. So, so it's scarcity in the end. So, so I want to blow people's minds here. I want to talk about some of the best blue chip investment cars right now. I want you to give us in the audience a couple of examples of what you think are the best investment cars, the top of the tree, the most expensive cars in the world. Asil. The most expensive cars in the world or the cars that will become expensive that you should buy now? No, the ones that are currently the most expensive, the ones that everybody wants if you're very, very rich. So there are some that have not hit public sale that we're sure will reach record prices. And the same way we haven't seen the Mona Lisa. Some examples. Okay, so the Bugatti Type 57 at Monty, that was a pre-war car when Bugatti was, you know, still Bugatti. Now it's Volkswagen. Price, price, Gary, yeah, price. So estimated prices from 25 to, to 60 million dollars. I'm definitely not being paid that much to be up on this stage. Can you to how much? To $65 million. We can only estimate. There are, there are four made and three exist. Find number four and you can ask for a hundred. That's what I'm doing right after the show. <laughs> I'm going to number four. I'm sure it's in Karama. Fred, what do you think is the most valuable car in the world right now? I'm selfish. I like our four males. I like oh, Italian man. cars. Um, I think um, the 6C, the 8C, um, they are very, very limited in numbers. Uh, they haven't exchanged hands a lot, and um, I think they're the next up comes. So if you can afford 25 to 60 million dollars, we have given you some useful consumer advice on what car to buy. Okay. Uh, regrettably, yes, you're talking very big numbers. Very, very big numbers. Well, you, need, you need the fortune to make a fortune in these cars. Uh, but the thing is, the 6Cs and the 8Cs, we have seen them come up for sale. But in terms of cars that haven't come up for sale, that's where it's interesting. The last time we had a Ferrari 330 P4, the more recent car for sale, was in our own auctions maybe seven or eight years ago, only sold for about eight or nine million euros. Whereas we think today that would hit stratospheric numbers, record, record breaking numbers. Okay, so we talked about the kind of options you have out there for cars. Is every classic car going up in the back? Is every old car worth something? No. No, we have some cars made in the US where they built hundreds of thousands of them. The Chrysler in New York of the 1970s. Yeah, um, I think we'll... The Dodge know, Diplomat. Our, our great-grandchildren will see a Chrysler 300C go up and down. The 150C used to drive around in. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the, the American Rolls Royce. Um, but no, no, not every old car is... is so just because you have a car and it's old and it's well-maintained and it's low miles, doesn't necessarily mean it's going up in value, is it? Precisely. I mean... You could find it from someone who doesn't know that it's worth a little bit more. An old lady, you buy it from her, you can resell it the next day for double the price potentially because you know the owner's club of the car or whatever. But that's not an investment, that's just a back to back way to deal. So, if you're talking about that, then obviously we not everybody in this audience has a fortune to go and buy a classic car. So, let's talk, let's come down to earth a little bit. Let's talk to the kind of people who, want, who have a bit of money saved up and they want to have it in classics a little bit. Let's talk about the real basics here. Where should they start? What should they do? Should they just go out and buy the first car they see, Fred? Well, I believe that they should look, seriously think about it deep inside. Uh, what is that car that they love so much? Is it a Mercedes? Is it something to do with their grandparents, their parents, their neighbors? So it really has to be something that they have uh, really wanted to have all along. And then they should really look into it. There are many places in Italy, there are many places in Germany, there are places in America. You can buy a car that is, needs a lot of restoration, you can buy a car that needs some restoration, and you can buy a car that... We have, I have a very good example. I have a client in Dubai who buys 1962-61 cars. Now he would pay up to $25,000 for a car, but he would invest up to $70,000 restoring the car. And when you do it that way, you will actually be having a car that will serve you very, very well for the next 20 years if you treat her correctly. Sorry, I do refer to cars as females. Okay, all right, let's go with that. But again, I'm asking a question here about how to actually get into it. At the end of the day, it's not easy to get into this thing. If 
you're just looking to make money. Because if you're looking to make money, will you make money? Or should you simply look for a car that appeals to you personally? I don't believe in making money. I'm not into making money. So just to tell you one is half off on all prices this week. Well, I believe, I believe that people should follow their heart. I really believe that people should um, find what they, what they see. If you can save money and put it aside to, to, to make you happy, to take, make your family happy, to take them out, to have something between you and your son or daughters, uh, with your wife, go away on a weekend. It's, it's something that you feel good about. I think save that money, put it aside, buy the car of your dreams. Enjoy it. Enjoy, Enjoy it. it and drive it. Yeah, take care of it. Bring it to me, I'll clean it for you. <laughs> Nicely done, so slick. I, I tell people all the time when they're potentially buying a car from us, I tell them two things. You want to be stuck with something that you actually like. If you're looking at it just in terms of a money point of view, then you've already made the wrong step. So you want to be stuck with something you like in case the market goes, you know, bottoms up. Um, and the second thing is you want to buy the best example of that car that you can afford. So you realize, you know, look at your budget, I can spend an absolute maximum of $75,000. Well, then you find the absolute best example possible for that kind of money. Best if you want to make a lot of money, then if you buy a top dollar car, and you obviously deal so you understand, if you buy a car for $75,000, it's not going to become worth $80,000 the next year. It's very few cases. No, I, 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 I disagree because when you buy a car that a pretend, the next buyer cannot fault, I'm not talking about an investment over six months, I'm talking about you know, minimum two years up to Now we're starting to get somewhere. So I think there are two classes of cars that are emerging. Basic kind of car that need a bit of restoration, a bit of work. You put in the time, you put in the effort, and you flip them and you make a decent amount of money. But the kinds of cars that you own over time escalate in value quite dramatically. No, no, not even that, because what I mean is, if you buy the best you can afford, meaning the next buyer cannot point fingers at any imperfections on it. They can't say, oh no, you don't have an extensive enough history, or no, it's not magic numbers, or no, there's a scuff there on the paint. You're buying the absolute best you can possibly afford, so that's what I mean there. In terms of the restoration game, buying, restoring, and flipping a car, the game is completely in the buying. You have to buy, and that's where you, where do you draw the line. I mean, do I buy a complete uh, rust bucket and then put a lot of money into restoring? Well, if it's the right Ferrari, sometimes that makes sense. If it's the right Ferrari, yes, but you know, even, you know, I was at an auction in Italy last year, and even real rust bucket examples of cars were going for silly money. $250,000 for, uh, for a Ferrari 250 GT Coupe. Do you think those people are foolish? Do you think they're just paying too much money for cars that need too much money? What they are is they're extremely wealthy and extremely bored. And so they, honestly, they enjoy the idea of getting this, this, this coal and polishing it over time into a diamond and supervising the restoration and, and, and learning about the little... It's just something for them to do, essentially. They don't really care if they make any money on it, yeah. I, I, uh, I have a client who bought a car with me uh, four years ago. It was an XK120. Uh, it took us three years to uh, uh, bring it back together, source the parts, uh, and sometimes make the parts ourselves. Um, it took us three years to build it. It took us three years to uh, perfect it. It took my team 286 hours to correct the paint. We enter it into a competition and we win it. And the price of the car immediately goes up. So there is another aspect to actually. Right, so tell us about that aspect because the competition aspect adds history or prominence to a car. Yes, I mean, we bought a car that was uh, one road from you, matching numbers. It was burned in a barn. So the, the, the body of the car was completely burned. Completely. And it took us three years to source everything interior, exterior, uh, engine, everything put them back together, uh, it cost us a fair deal of money, a lot of arguments, a lot of fights, but in the end, um, she was a concourse car, and she entered the concourse in Dubai, she won the restoration, uh, best restoration project uh, award, and the, the price of the car immediately went up another percentage. Absolutely. So, Asi, if we're talking about cars that you're looking to buy, and own and drive, and perhaps make a bit of profit on what should they be looking for? Give us the bullet points. Well, cars that still haven't been really picked up by the public market, meaning... Let's take the car out of the equation. Let's just see what are you looking for when you shop for a classic car? History provenance. Can you explain what these things are? Okay, well, we're looking for matching numbers, as Fred mentioned. For those of you who don't know, it means that the exact engine that's in the car is the exact engine that it was delivered new with, the same VIN numbers and serial numbers. 
the gearbox as well, sometimes even the differential number, the body number, and things like that. We have clients asking us, what's the body number? And occasionally it's a car where, uh, I don't know, uh, but we'll find out, and then it's a learning experience. So you want to get matching numbers, because again, it goes back to my point of it's easier to resell afterwards. Um, so matching numbers, if it's a car, it depends also on if you want to work on a car or not. If you don't want to work on a car and you already want to get something that's ready to go, come to us. But also, uh, oi, 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 keep it on track. Here. But but also, you want to buy a car that's completely rust-free, that's showing no evidence of rust, things like that. You want originality. That is very important for us. What we're trying to educate people on as well. And it goes down to very minute details sometimes. You know, you want to have the original indicator stalk. You know, you want to have the correct wheels for that model of car, the correct indicator. So if, it, if you're looking at a car that you're, you don't actually know much about, but you know you want one, it's good to do one of two things, or both. Get in touch with the owners' clubs of these cars on the forums and ask them questions. Talk to owners' clubs, they'll know yeah. because they run the cars. They precisely, the precisely. And the other thing is it's worth paying the extra money to actually hire a specialist in those cars to fly over and look at that car and inspect it inside and out. Because one of two things will happen at the end of the show. Either A, he'll tell you, great, it's a good car, and you can sleep easy at night knowing you have a good car. Or B, he'll tell you, you really do not want to do that, and then you've avoided a potential risk. So it's like a car inspection, isn't it? Well, it is a car inspection, quite literally. Well, that's the truth, it is. Sorry, you caught me on. Well, okay, quick show of hands from the audience. How many of you have owned a classic car? Okay, a fair few of you, okay. Fair few of you. How many of you would like to own a classic car? Great. Okay, so a lot of you would like to get into it, but again, this is the perfect kind of view. We're talking about how to make a fortune on classics. So, ask your friend. Next question, and you can't think too long about this. Which cars do you think are undervalued right now? Lancia Fulvias. <laughs> is it because you own one? Well, I got in at a good time because they have not been under the spotlight. And honestly, they're the last car that Lancia uh, uh, made before they were taken over by Fiat. So arguably, it's the last real Lancia. Then again, the Stratos made that. Well, Lancia is a pretty much a production at this point. They still make them, but they really just rebadged Chrysler's. Well, they're precisely, they rebadged Chrysler's. So they, really so they, the brand has gone to hell, essentially. I mean, honestly, Vittorio Lancia returning in his way. You go to their website, they only have one car up for sale, and they have a bunch of handbags on the website as well. Because Marchione had to choose when he took over Fiat. He had to choose, right, do I prioritize Alfa Romeo or do I prioritize Lancia? Well, this is a very dramatic retelling of the story. <laughs> I don't think actually Sergio Marchione, the CEO of Fiat, actually sat and waved his hands about in the air. I like to think he did. Yeah. Okay, apart from the car that you personally own, <laughs> do you have some actual investing advice for us? Well, in terms of which cars to go which for? Which cars are undervalued? Which ones are the next ones that are going up? I, and you know, I think he's not going to like this, but I think the, uh, the Volkswagen Carmen gear has potential to move. Uh, That's not too expensive right now, is it? What are the prices of those running around? No, it's not. I mean, you can, you can find a, a, a good one, not a superb, perfect one. You can find a good one for about $25,000, right? Like that. Um, I totally disagree because I don't believe in cars that were made for the American market. But American cars? You don't believe in American cars? No, I don't believe in European cars that were made for the American market. That's quite a large group you just cut out there. Yes, I have. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, most of them were convertibles, cabriolets. So um, the Ferrari California is not a good in blue chip investment? <laughs> no, I'm talking about the era that you just mentioned. But plus, they are rust buckets. I think uh, Carmen Gears were guaranteed to rust, like Italian cars in the 60s and 70s. So they're not good cars, that's for sure. Absolutely not. But, uh, so you just recommended a car that's not good? Absolutely. Well, the Countach isn't a good car either. We've had three of them. How much are the Countach selling for these days? Um, anywhere from $200,000 all the way up to 1.1, 1.2 million if it's an early one like the Blue And how does it drive? Uh, God awful when it's going slowly, but when it's on the move, it is literally like the ball. The, this car is representative of its, of its logo. It I'd, like like to, it's I'd like to mention something. A few days ago, we drove a classic car in a race. Um, very understated car. Now, I have been offered that car in the past for 10,000 sterling, and I never bought it. And today, I truly regret it. Um, I don't know if we're allowed to mention this or not, but we drove the 1972 Lamborghini Carama. You didn't wait for an answer, so I guess it's Lamborghini Yes, I guess it is. But um, what a fabulous car. What a beautiful engine. What a nice seating. I mean, it was really, really nice. And you I think this is... You the show part early, didn't you? I did come second, yes. Not only because we... Who, who came third? Car. Who came third? I want to know who came third. Third was 15 minutes behind us. Oh! But who was third? 
a very unpleasant individual. You don't listen to the most. It's actually almost put his hand up. Yeah. Asin, did you come first? Not at all. No, I think he came seventh, eighth, I don't know. But, well, you know, we were called sponsors of the event, so... Uh, no, no, so seriously, really going back to Alman Mahidi Karama, that would have cost maybe, I would say, seven, eight years ago, we're talking about $10,000, 10,000 stone. Seriously, this is an under... How much is it now? I don't know how much he's selling it for. It's, uh, it's, it's our car, it's actually on our stand over there, the seven film Alman Mahidi. Uh, no, just gone. Uh, that's, that's number three right there, thank you. Yeah. $175,000 today. Wow, so from $10,000 to $100,000. Sterling, $10,000. Sterling, $10,000. Sterling, $10,000. Oh, Sterling, that blue Porsche is over there as well, we should mention. But we're not talking about the cars that Fred let get away. What are the cars that you think is undervalued right now? A good buy that's kind of affordable that people in the audience could afford? Di Tommaso. Which one? Um, Bali? Pantera. The Pantera. Is that the one that Elvis shot? Yes. yes, he did. He famously Elvis shot holes in that car because he really was fed up with how often it broke down. No, well, it's, a, it's an easy car to repair. It's an easy car to maintain. It was designed by an Argentinian, if I'm not mistaken. Did that make him better or worse than building it? Well, they're really bad at football, so I don't want to discuss it right now. I apologize to all the Argentinian audience. I don't care about football, so it's fine. Nobody gave him an engine in Italy, so he went to the Americans, and they gave him an easy, repairable Ford. 351 cubic inch. There you go. This is a very beautifully designed car. It looks magnificent. Elvis had one. And it has an engine Briefly. that can be modified and he can make it a beast. So I said, how much are one of those going for? Ballpark. Our car is an 8,000 mile one in its original, so it's a higher end one, so it's $145,000. But Pantera is going to go I'd say complete. Average, because they built about 9,000 cars over 15 years, you're looking at a, a, an average, a mean average of, I'd say, 55 to 65,000 dollars. I would say this. So that's not too bad. People get into that. And how long would they need to keep that car and hold that car before they could make a decent return? And what's well, the return? If I knew the perfect answer to that question, I'd be a millionaire right now. But no, I think, I think honestly, within within five to ten years, yes, they will definitely make money. I believe that if you actually find a car, um, a Pantera, we're speaking about the Tito Maso right now. If you can find one around $35,000, dollars invest a further $20,000 in the car, enjoy it, drive it, I think this car will be making a lot of money in the future. Okay, so from one extreme to the other, which cars do you think will never go up in value? The worst possible candidates, the mis I want to get people to avoid buying bad cars. Yes, sir. Uh, you can have a second. Most coverage? Sorry, which one is yours? A Russian car called Moscow. No, no, don't go for the easy one. Don't go for the Nissan Sunny. The Sunny is a lovely car. The Sunny is a lovely car. They had the motor show. But which cars? Classic cars. I'm talking classic cars. Come on. Take a second to think about it if you need to. So, Fred, off you go. Um, with all due respect, not all French cars were really... Not all French cars are classics. Give me an example. No, no, not classics, sorry. They weren't really... Uh, they, they don't go up in price. Maybe a few, a Renault 5. Uh, which ones don't go up in price? The Renault 4, I mean, if you if you build hundreds of thousands of a car, it's not really going to go up in price. It will go up in price. Dime a dozen, so the Renault 4 will never go up in price. It's the Beetle, for example. Everybody knows what a Beetle is. Will the Volkswagen Beetle It will never go up in price because they make millions of it. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The early, early Beetles, the split window cars, the over window cars, yes, they have. And because you have one in the showroom. But if, no, no, honestly, but if you go for a 1970s, 80s, 90s Beetle, then no, no, it's not going to go up in price. No, because they made they made build them in Mexico or build them in Brazil, put them in Egypt even I think. Didn't they? Was that the Lada? No, no comment. Okay. Uh, oh, just so they built so many of them from all over the place for so many decades. That, no, the, the later big light wheel Beatles won't go up in that way. Hold on. What about modern cars? Because classics are not just cars from the seventies or eighties. We're talking modern supercars. And now, for example, the Lamborghini Gallardo is the most produced car in Lamborghini history. Is that ever going to be a classic? No. And everybody knows what the Gallardo is, right? Everybody knows what the Gallardo is. What's the Gallardo? Apart from Fred, everybody knows what the Gallardo is. No, I, no I, I, think, I think they will, even though they've built so many of them. I think if you get the, get the Gallardo in its purest form, the first generation, and if you go for one of the actual limited edition ones, not the not so special special editions, uh, then yes, I think they will. I think the Malboni version will go up in value with a manual gearbox. You know, the Valentino Malboni version with a stripe. That's because I'm the guy likes them. I do like Valentino, he's adorable. Um, uh, but yeah, I think, I think because Lamborghini don't do two-wheel drive cars 
much anymore. The, the two-wheel drive versions of the V10 cars will go for value, I think, yeah. So you think, uh, what, do you have any other examples of some cars that are just awful and will never go up in value? Uh, I, I can't really think of that. Dutchess. You just love cars too much. Sorry. Oh, he's Romanian over there. Sorry, Alex. Yes, actually. Apart from the Romanian the audience, we all have to <laughs> What about the East German car, which is called the Trabant? The Trabant. Oh, they made a lot of them. But they're kind of cliche cool. They're like a bit hipster. So maybe they might go up in value. Well, I, people buy them ironically. Hipsters are interesting, huh? Because, because you know, the, the whole... the car show. Still the, the car show. The, 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 the whole petrolicious world. It's so focused on Alfa Romeo, and Alfa Romeo is now, I think, the coolest classic car brand to get. And I think that is massively helping, because, you know, you know, you have your average hipster who is just into his organic stuff, but then some of them are car guys, and those car guys will be going for things like that. Literally some of them. Yeah, literally some of them are, um, are going for Alfa. So I think that's actually going to have a bigger impact than we think on the values of Alfa Romeo. So I think Alfa Romeo and Porsche are going to be where uh, uh, Ferrari are. Speaking of Porsches, Porsches have seen a meteoric rise in prices in 911. And they've made a lot of them, but the fact is they're featured in pop culture, so media and so on. I'm not going to talk about cars and movies, because that's on the panel tomorrow evening, which you're going to have a lot of fun talking about. But which cars, in your opinion, are overvalued right now? 911 R, or everything from... Everything from so Porsche what's the 911 R? Why are people so thinking... Porsche 911 R, 911 Porsche, Porsche came out with basically a GT3 RS without a rear wing or with a manual gearbox, which is something they've been doing for decades and they've stopped largely recently. Um, and so it's again what I call, it's marketing genius, but it's a not so special specialist. So you can something away and they charge more for it. Exactly. I mean, you look at the 2.7 RS, um, when they, they made two versions in 1973, the Touring and the Lightweight. The Lightweight was lighter and stripped out, so they charged you less. But the Touring was more luxurious and heavy, and they charged you more for it. They do the complete opposite today. So it's all marketing cleverness. And if anything has taught us, the last year and a half has taught us anything about the classic car and collectible car market, it's that buyers are getting wiser to these things. So if I take the seats out of my pickup, it suddenly becomes a super leggera and I can charge me thousand dollars more for it. It's a GMC super leggera, see? Right. Fred, do you have an example? Overvalued cars, too expensive, don't invest your money. Very difficult question. Very That's why I asked it, because you're the expert panelist and our guest about how to make a fortune on Life and hope is poor, no offense to Ralph. No, I'm sorry, I'm not going to answer that. It's like choosing my best song or my best group or my... But this is choosing your most overvalued, overplayed song, actually. Your Britney Spears song. Your Hotel California equivalent of the cars. Yeah. Um, 1936 uh, Alfa Romeo 8C. That's overvalued to you? Yes. How, how much is it overvalued to you? Because you can't afford it. I can't afford it at all. You can't talk down cars. You can have how to make a fortune on cars, not to get them cheap as a friend can buy them. <laughs> yes, regrettably not. Um, we're, we're coming down to the end of our panel. We're going to open up the floor to questions because I'm sure the audience wants to know how to make a fortune on classic cars. I certainly do because I have and I'm still poor. But no. first, really quickly, a couple more questions. What are the common mistakes people make ourselves when they buy classics as an investment, not to drive, they buy it to make a bit of money? What are the mistakes they make? The biggest mistake, the single biggest mistake I think is that they see, let's say, a 300 SL Goldwing Mercedes sell at auction for $6 million. Little do they know it's one of 29 aluminium bodied cars, so it's exceptionally rare. Then they see a 300 SL Goldwing that they can buy for $900,000 and think, oh god, I'm going to make a killing here. But they're not educated enough about the car, they don't actually know what they're looking at. So they buy this car, so it's an okay condition, it's worth $6 million. No, it's not for a multitude of reasons. First of all, you can forget the part about the aluminium body. But no, the car you're talking about is perfectly documented. The car you're talking about is matching numbers. The car you're talking about is matching colors, has provenance, has a famous so you example. You can't compare prices just because the cars have Precise. similar years, even similar mileages. There can be a vast gulf between how much these cars are worth. Well, that's the name of the game as well, because also restored cars, the perfectly the restored cars, the, the perfectly restored cars are the ones that are fetching the best numbers, but it depends on who restored it. You know what I mean? Oh, well, so there's actually a difference in who restores the cars as well. Massively. When you see a so classic... my uh, friend in Satwa who puts exactly. cars in his oil changes shouldn't be working on your six million dollar SF. No, and, and and we see this with Ferraris as well. Anytime a classic Ferrari goes up for auction, when it's written Maranello Restoration, that speaks volumes. People don't understand. What is Maranello Restoration? So Maranello is the city where. Ferrari is based and was created. Yeah, I've worked that out. I know. I have Google Maps. I know okay. Maranello is. <laughs> um, 
And so a Maranello restoration basically means that, uh, let's say you have a 1950s Ferrari, if you took it to Maranello to be restored, that means there's a plethora of garages, a few dozen garages, that that one, he, you know, the guy who runs this garage used to actually build them back in period. The guy who runs this garage used to install the, the electrics back in period. And so a Maranello restoration means that a car has gone through, with its very this bits and pieces, has gone through a, a multitude of shops to become a perfect example. And even when you pay hundreds of thousands of euros uh, to Ferrari Classic Department to restore a car, they end up doing the same thing anyway. They end up taking it to these shops. You you a fortune, and you just go to some guy in the village. Absolutely. Who's sitting there for the last 40 years, sitting on his... Well, the Classic Park, the Department of Ferrari has eight staff members for the last 10 years, and... Eight staff members? Yeah, eight, eight, yeah. And how much do they charge for certification? Well, for certification, it varies between $2,000 to $12,000, and next year, there's word around the campfire is that's going to change depending on the value of the cars. Meaning to restore a $50 million 250 GTO to get it certified will end up costing $20,000 to $25,000. But people, I don't know if everyone understands what Classic K is though. Okay, since that's good, you're learning. What does Classic K mean? Classic K certification is again a two to $12,000 process from Ferrari. It takes usually a minimum of six months, maximum of a year and a half whereby they inspect the car, they look at it, they look at all the numbers, they lift up the carpets, they take photos, they send them back to Italy, and it's basically an expensive, beautiful red document that says, on this date, this car was period correct. So, How much does that add to the value of a car? It, it, it depends, not sure, it depends on the car. But, uh, but anywhere from 5 to 20% on the car. 20% that's and, and which, But it does get important sometimes. I mean, on your average Testarossa, on your average Daytona, it, it's not that important. But when you're talking about a car that raced in period, Classic K department in Ferrari, they have access to all the archives. They have access to things that we don't as common people. They're all handwritten notes for like Absolutely, things. absolutely. And sometimes there is no documentation as well on, on a few select cars. So but when, you're, when you're spending $25, $30 million on a racing Ferrari, you want to know that it's a genuine one, and so the Classic K file is a certificate of authenticity, essentially, but Basically, 40 yeah. pages long. So Fred, what are the mistakes you think people make when they buy Classic cars? And you've seen so many cars come through your shop. I say stop thinking about making money, and I say so even stop. Small I'm of... sorry, I don't agree with it. I, I totally don't agree with it. I think people should enjoy, should have fun. I think people should, uh, people work hard to make money. And you are talking about the mass of people. Not everybody is a millionaire, not everybody is, is super rich that they can buy cars worth 20, 30 million dollars or sterling or whatever. I think we're talking about the normal people who work very, very hard for their money. If they can save money and they have a desire to, to buy something because they have a dream to fulfill, I think this is what they should go for. Stop thinking about making money. St start thinking about enjoying it. And, and I, I enjoy my life, I enjoy my cars, I enjoy my bikes, I enjoy everything that I do because it is on my level. It, I'm, I don't look at other people's standards and try to copy them. I, I look at my size, I look at what I do and what I can afford. And I do it for myself, I do it for my family. And this is what I'm trying to say. I think solely looking at the classic car purchase financial standpoint to make money on. If that's your only reason, then you really shouldn't get into it and, you're, and you know, it, 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 you're not in the right place. However, so I agree with that disagree, Fred, as a petrol head, but as someone who is in the business as well, my Lancia, for example, I did not think about making money on it. I adored it, it was in my price range. I called, I called, it's in the shop, it's not going to make money that It's an Italian car, so I drive it, you know, 20% uh, of the time it's working, 80% it isn't. But as, the day after I bought it, I actually called Fred from Italy, from Maranello, I said, I bought myself a Lancia Forby, and I remember his words, and I'll never forget them. He said, uh, that's the best decision you've ever made in your life. He says that to all the boys. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd like to open it up to the audience, and we'd like to say, if you have any questions about how to make a fortune, you all know about classic cars, these are your men. So don't be shy, put your hand up if you have a question, and my beautiful sister will get a mic to you. Come on, somebody got a question. Oh, front row. I'll go here first, and then I'll come here. So please say who you are first and then ask whoever you'd like. Uh, I'm Marcelan Bela from Pakistan. I've been a collector for a number of years. I've restored a lot of and uh, from scooters to uh, right now restoring a Playboy 1934 uh, Rolls Royce. 
So my question is where I can find the best resources because uh, I'm finding it hard to look up manuals for the 1924 growth boys. And uh, uh, the other question, the specific question is it has it has the uh, uh, jacks in the uh, in the chassis and one of them is missing. Where can I source these parts cheaply so I can make money or some uh, or save money on it? That's a really specific question. You can't, you can't get cheap pre-war parts. For Alfa so Alfa Romeo, we wanted to get a toolkit. It's virtually impossible. So cheap, you're going to have to probably remove that from the equation unless you find a great builder who can replicate that part and make it in-house, I think. Well, I mean, we have to use the internet. We do live in the world wide web. We all have phones. We all have internet. I think this is your best source. But I think you have to also keep in mind that there are people who actually have parts they keep it to themselves and they're not willing to sell them. If they're not willing to sell them, you can actually replicate them and they don't mind. People do like sharing and they do like helping. Uh, you just have to find the right source and you have to convince them that you have something that nobody else has and it is your right to actually bring it up. Uh, I applaud you. I love people like you. I think you're doing a great job. I hope you continuously do it. Um, just keep at it. I, I, I had a Jaguar. Sometimes it took me more than three years to find a single part that lives inside the boot or somewhere. In the end, I had to replicate it. And I had to get it time after time. We made, we made it like maybe four or five times until we got it right. So try to replicate it if you can buy it. What I would do in your shoes as well is I would get in touch with the best restorers of, of this period of roller. Um, and, and speak to them and you know it, it will it, it may cost you a fair bit but again you're preserving a piece of history for the next custodian you know you, you are holding something that's nearly a hundred years old it deserves to have an original part it deserves to be loved in terms of, of, of you driving it and caring for it but in terms of money as well I mean for my Lancia I just spent 9,000 dirhams worth of parts on the car the car you know, it's not going to add to its value at all it's just killing my wallet but I, I, I think the car deserves those original bits and pieces, you know. I think that's uh, a really good point, actually. The, in fact, the internet makes it so much easier now to restore cars. Because in the old days, you just didn't know where the parts were. You didn't know where the cars, the, the restorers are. But now, thanks to the internet, you can find people. And you can get parts shipped to you from all over the world in a matter of minutes. My Lancia parts guy is a guy called Aiden, based in uh, Los Angeles. And every time he sends parts, he sends a bag of, uh, of, of California He's a coffee. He's sucker, bought a Lancia. <laughs> It eats up your money, yeah, and it doesn't Do we have another question, gentlemen in front? Yeah, I'd like to support um, Frederick because uh, you were always asking about making a fortune, making money. This is absolutely wrong thinking. Um, the classical market is established out of passion. People found a car, an old Mercedes or something in the garage of their grandmother, and they kept it like this. And there was never the focus to make money out of it. All of a sudden they jumped, and that's why everybody's today is jumping onto profit and want to make um, they want to make money out of it. And now you're too late. And now you have to invest into young timer. And maybe a young timer will bring you money now. And uh, if you don't have the budget for it. Yeah, I like that line you said about it being too late. In my generation, the cars we look up to were NSXs, GTRs, Honda Civics. Diablos. Yeah, yeah, generally, Diablos and stuff. But I'm, I'm really talking about Japanese because I know you focus mostly on the European and America. What's your honest opinion about the 90s, 80s Japanese and whether or not you believe they are classics and they will appreciate it? So modern There's classics, basically. Definitely. I want to answer before he does because he's going to spit on all Japanese cars. Uh, but a mixture of two things, the whole need for speed and tuner games on the PlayStation, because the PlayStation generation, and Fast and the Furious. These have had a massive impact on these cars. So you imagine someone who, well, again, like you, or someone in their, in their teens who has been watching all the Fast and Furious movies and playing all these video games, you know, you fast forward to when they're 50 years old and they have money, they're going to look back at that. One of the biggest they're influences... They're going to have the fingers as well, because they're pressing those buttons really I would go back to Datsuns, wait, place. wait, I have to go back to Datsuns when they were 240Cs and Zs and... Uh, Those uh, are beautiful cars though. They are beautiful cars. Uh, you see, Japanese. Japanese. The ja absolutely. No, the GT was a Japanese. These, these guys came into the market, they destroyed Europe and America. 
they literally destroyed the, the, the whole world. The cars were very simple, they looked beautiful. And they worked. And they worked, they didn't break down. And they down. still work today? And they were the economy? Yes, absolutely. Because you know, in the 19, early 1970s, with the whole you know, the fuel crisis happened, as <laughs> an Arab, it's <laughs> Suez. Uh, when that happened, the, the, you know, U.S. imports they cut down seriously on emissions, etc. These Japanese cars were just consuming less fuel, so it was more attractive. They were there. Yeah, it was their time. But I must talk to people. Somebody from my generation. I grew up. Let's say in my twenties with early two thousands, and those cars. I see where you're coming from. Those cars are cool to me. Stuff from the eighties, stuff from pop culture, stuff from nineties. Stuff from the 70s is all starting to go a bit of a blur and muscle cars, though they are cool to me, I don't think I'll ever get into one, but I could see myself driving an NSX, so I see where he's coming from, and I think that's the next market, but it's going to take a while. Do we have time for some more questions? Can we have any more questions in the back, sir? Can you wear the glasses? 2002 BMW. 2002? Not actually made in 2002. What would be a good young timer? Uh, for about, let's say, $25,000, and it's, it's relatively easy to maintain as well. The, the Germanics, when they say young timer, they mean a more modern car, and then when they say old timer, it means a classic car, just for those who don't know. $25,000, a young timer, a modern contemporary car that will go up in value. Um, did you say go up in value? Or did you say a good car? A good car, and then it's also easy to maintain. So you, you wouldn't have an awful lot of running. Cars. So that puts Lancia out of it. Uh, I think it have to be something Japanese, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, no. the 240Z. What the CRX? If you get a CRX, it's not much money. But, but 240Z is much cooler though. $25,000 if you look to the US, the US cars. But he said young timer. Yeah. He did say young timer. That's why I said CRX, maybe in the 80s. Yeah. I would go for BMWs. Yeah. I would go for the 2002. Maybe in 1802, uh, maybe a few models thereafter. They're a bit older. Uh, excuse me. They're a bit older. They're really young times. Uh, are, they, are, they, are, are these young, young cars? Yes, young cars. Uh, 320, 323s, uh, beautiful cars. The Germans were really, really good at it. Some Italians, but regrettably, they were made to rust. Um, I think a Ferrari 456 oh, project car. Can I, can I jump in on this? Can I jump in on this as well? Because I, I identify with that totally. And I think. You guys up there have been talking about all those rich, expensive cars of Ferraris and all that sort of stuff, you know. But, you know, you've got a point. And the thing is that cars that I own, I regret selling them now. I'm talking about an 88 Honda CRX. I'm talking about an 88 BMW 325i. I'm talking about a 1984 Celica Supra. Because all of these cars, when I had them and I sold them, they were cheapies. But I look them up now, A, you can't find them, and B, if you can, they're three, four, five times the price that I sold them. Corvette C5 Z06, I think. Basically, it seems that's like that's anything really that you can find from the 80s, or indeed the 90s, and I think the 90s are now coming up, that's in good condition, original, not uh, tuned, not modified, completely stock, put it away. Because honestly, I think they will go up. Any old Honda, they're all, all rusted. So if you can find a good Mark 1 Civic or Mark 1 Accord, there is a cult following for those cars, and those cars are going up. I know Tomini won't be looking at those sort of cars. But no, but we support them. I mean, the yeah. guy who drove the Mustang and the, the rally, the red Mustang, he was quite endearing. He said that coming to visit Tomini Classics and going through our showroom is what inspired to, him to get a classic car. And at the end of the day, my main goal with Tomini Classics is to share it with Dubai and make the car community smaller. That's why I love events like this because I look in the audience and there are six or seven people that I know because it's 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 bringing the car community together. So it is massively important to, to even the lower end cars. And I really genuinely think so that a Corvette C5 Z06 with lowish miles, $25,000, or a, a Dodge Viper RT10, the first one, three spoke rims, modest mileage, something like 50. Too expensive, too expensive to run. Can I Go make for your no, 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 no. As the as the moderator, 1998 BMW M3 because I owned one and they were great. Yeah, that's clever too, huh? Beautiful. Yeah, going up Renault, Renault 5 Turbos GT, Renault 5 Turbo 2, you can still find them. They don't have to be two or five. They double the price. price. They have minimum of double the, the price he was looking at, though. Alright, time for one more question. Does anybody have any more questions in the audience? In, gentlemen in front, anybody else? Renault Clear Williams, that's a good one. Renault Clear Williams in the show. Yeah. Any more questions in the audience? Oh, with the German. Mercedes 190E Cosworth. 
Yeah, but that's more than twenty-five thousand dollars. That's the thing. If, it, if it's in terms of the gentleman that the bank's question, then you know the, 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 those are gone up already, haven't they? Yeah, they already have, and I think they can. Actually, like, interestingly, interestingly, Top Gear. Um, um, Oh, just over 10 years ago, they were talking about classics, and they brought up the Volkswagen Corrado and the 190E Cosworth. And they did talk about that, and they said the classic car needs to be rare, beautiful, and there was another uh, factor they had to meet. And they did talk exactly and about work, that car, so that's quite money. But at the bank, it's a four-door, four and I think if, you're gonna, if you want to play it safe, and you're only looking at, at financially speaking, but then, yeah, the two doors... That's good, Delta Integrale. Delta Integrale is very good. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah really I good. think we're out of time. We got one, 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 one more, one more question. Just which rallies are uh, uh, I want? Uh, I participated in rallies in Kuala Lumpur, Pakistan, and one in Sydney. Which rallies would you uh, suggest to people? Mm -hmm. If you want to experience something, it's like classic cars. Go to the Mini Amelia in Italy. It is fabulous. Go to the historic Grand Prix of Monte Carlo. You will see cars from the 20s, 30s, 40s all the way up, and they have individual racing. Um, if you're a petrol head and you believe in these things, this is the place to go to, Italy and Monte Carlo. But then again, there are races taking place in winter in the Alps in, in, in Europe. And these are people, I, I have a lot of friends who do that. And if you want a gargantuan, titanic kind of rally, do Beijing to Paris. Yes. Beijing to Paris, that's... Uh... Uh, Beijing to Paris, it's, it's, a, it's a race that took place in 1907 and it's taking place every five years. But you have to have a car that is really, really strong. Something, that it, this is something, this is advice to you. If you have 15, 20 cars, it's totally irrelevant. Have one car that you know inside out, yes. you know how to repair it, you know how to maintain it, you know everything about it. And that car, you can enjoy life with it. The other cars, you can show them off, you can put them in a museum, you can do as you please with them. But always have one car that you actually know everything about and that you do everything yourself. Don't rely on others. Make it yourself, make it happen yourself. It's, it's very enjoyable. I think uh, there's another input uh, where you find nice cars, for, for example, Le Mans Classic. Uh, the classic cars uh, in Le Mans, the race is four days long. Very nice cars. You see hundreds of Mercedes, hundreds of Porsche, many Aston Martins. Go to Essen Auto Show, go to the classic car shows. I assume that it's still the Geneva classic, is it still on? Not sure. Um, come to Dubai. Or, or, or the good word is another good one. We just had the show park classic rally, that's super. It's a regular roller over from Pakistan. Right. We are really out of time now. We've gone over time, we've had a great panel. Can you please big round of applause to our two panelists, Fred and Asim?